This Week in Global Health stands. Uh, this Week in Global Health is a live weekly Global Health News Roundup. So if you're watching this live, please feel free to interact with us on Twitter and on Google+. Plus. Um, of course, some of you might be watching this in the future at some point on YouTube. You might be listening to the podcast, so welcome to you as well. We're going to be talking about health systems during the month of January, and we're going to jump right in. I'm going to. We've got a couple of guest speakers. We've got a really exciting lineup. We're going to jump right in and do a quick introduction of the panel. I'll start with myself. My name is Greg Martin. Uh, next, we'll go to Jessica. Jessica, could you just tell us a little bit about who you are? Hey, everyone. I'm Jessica Taff. Happy New Year. It's great to be on the show again. Great to have you guys watching, and um, I'm here from Washington, D.C., and uh, we'll be talking about health systems today. I'm pretty excited about it. Okay, next up, Christopher. Chris, Chris, not Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's what Katie says my name is. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Ronson. I'm coming to you from San Francisco, California. Apparently, I go by Christopher as well. Uh, <laughs> and I am just as enthusiastic about Jessica as uh, for being here today and really excited about our guest panelists and guest speakers today. So it's going to be an awesome show. Chris, you, you wouldn't believe that we speak every week. I mean, you know, getting your name wrong would imply that this is the first time we've ever met. Actually, <laughs> it's cool. I'll let it go. Okay. But new to the show, we've got Terry. Terry, talk to us. Well, hi, Greg, and good morning, everybody. It's morning out here in Southern California, where I'm hailing from. I'm looking forward to participating with you all this month and uh, excited also to be with talking about health systems. Okay, fantastic. And over to Agnes. Agnes at the CDC. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Agnes Navasli. Uh, it's such a rewarding opportunity to be with uh, this group uh, this this week in global health uh, to join the dialogue on health systems. Uh, I look forward to the rest of the session and thank you so much for having us. Thanks very much, Agnes. And then, last but not least, we're very excited to have Dr. Jonathan Quick. He's the chief executive of Management Sciences for Health on the show. Uh, Jonathan, could you quickly just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, thanks very much, uh, uh, Greg Martin and the whole team at, uh, at This Week in Global Health. I appreciate the chance to talk with you today. Uh, I'm a family physician. I have, uh, and my name is Dr. Jonathan Quick. Uh, most people call me Jono. Uh, I have the uh, great joy of leading uh, a nonprofit management sciences for health. And I'm here just in a town a little bit north of Boston, uh, experiencing a lot of cold weather right now. Okay. Okay, Jonathan. John, could you quickly, we're going to be talking about health systems, but before we talk about health systems, the fact that you're, 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 you're the chief exec at Management, uh, Management Sciences Health, could you tell us a little bit about the organization itself, and then we'll jump into a discussion on health systems. Yes, Management Sciences for Health, MSH, is a uh, global health nonprofit. It's been around since uh, 1971. Our vision is a world where everyone has the opportunity for a healthy life. And we believe that strong health systems are necessary for greater health impact. We're operating in over 60 countries. We're 2,500 people from over uh, 70 nationalities. Our, our key aim is to build locally led, help build, work shoulder to shoulder with people in country to build locally led, locally run health systems. We uh, regularly and proudly work ourselves out of a job, but not out of a career. Okay, fantastic. Now, Jonathan or Jono, as you go by, look, we're going to be talking about uh, health systems for the for the rest of this evening or, or the, the day, where, where, depending on where you are. But and of course, for the rest of the month, actually, on on, on Twig. But could we just start? Now, can I ask you to give us just in a nutshell, what is it? What do we mean by health systems? What are what are health systems? Health systems are basically the, the people, the medical products, the medicines, the financing, the health information to organize that, the service delivery systems, and the leadership that puts all of this together into a coherent program for prevention and treatment of major diseases. It's about giving people access to affordable, quality health services for preventive and treatment. Okay, brilliant. And Jonathan, could you perhaps just talk us through a little bit about why it is and why and perhaps how MSH had, uh, uses health, the health systems approach to address global health problems? Well, this, the simplest answer is because it works to create an effective, efficient delivery of services. But let me give you an example of what happens when it's not there. 
In December of 2001, when the Taliban were chased from power in Afghanistan, there were effectively no female health workers active anywhere in the country. Access to primary care was less than 10 percent. Immunization was less than 20 percent. And nine out of ten women delivered without a skilled birth attendant. Nine out of ten women on their own for labor and delivery. That was no health system. Ten years later, immunization had doubled. Access to family planning was, was doubled or tripled and higher than in many countries in Africa that have been at it. 150,000 fewer infants and children were dying every year. And maternal mortality was down two-thirds. How did that happen? A visionary minister of health, Dr. Sahela Siddiqui, she looked out and said, we're going to rebuild and we're going to build a health system that, that, uh, tar that targets maternal and child health. Trained hundreds of community midwives, thousands of community health workers, half ma male, half female, set up the supply system for those, uh, got the financing, had the overall um, health delivery system worked out, and they had the information to monitor the results, and it was her leadership that uh, that made that happen. So that's that's the six elements of health systems, and it was life saving. Well, I want to jump in and thank you, Jonathan, for that. That was really great—a good overview of what the health systems are and, and uh, um, what you guys what you guys are doing with it. Um, what what is Management Sciences for Health doing with uh, in regard to the health systems? Um, well, we we actually work at several different levels. So one part of that is leadership development, working with um, uh, with leaders at all levels. Leadership is important from the community to to the uh, the uh, all the way up to parliament. So leadership development is part of it. Developing uh, health worker training programs, for example, those thousands of uh, health workers in Afghanistan uh, that I mentioned, we help set the program up. We're we're out of there. They're doing it on their own now. Um, private sector approaches. The most common source of care in many low-income countries is not a trained provider, but the drug the uh, drug seller down the street. So we've worked in partnership with the private sector, with Gates Foundation, with ministries of health uh, to accredit uh, uh, drug uh, drug medicine providers. So it's working to build all of the the systems, but also the the overall structure and, and policy environment that makes it all work. And, and actually deliver results for the people of the country. Awesome. That's that's really great to hear. Um, I want to jump in and then direct a question to Agnes. But before I do, I just want to say thank you to Terry and Agnes for all the work that they've done planning this. Uh, actually, it's going to be a series of shows on health systems this month, and they are the ones behind it. So I just want to say thank you so much. Um, and they're also responsible for getting our guest speakers, including Dr. Quick tonight today. So uh, thank you so much for doing that. And they deserve a round of applause for that. Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> So, um, okay, but <laughs> I have a question for Agnes. I, after all my enthusiasm, let me let me take a notch down. Um, so, Agnes, so Dr. Quick was telling us about what health systems are and everything, and the MSH approach to it. But I want to ask you, what do you think uh, a responsive, well-functioning health system looks like? What would it be achieving? Tell me some of the characteristics that we would be looking for. Uh, thank you very much, Jessica. Um, Again, building on to the introduction that has been presented by Dr. Quick, uh, a well-functioning, responsive health system should be able to improve the health status uh, of uh, people, individuals, and communities. Um, in this, we are looking at reduced mobility and death that is preventable. Uh, being, if a system is able to do that, then we have such a very powerful tool in our hands to be able to address some of the big challenges we are facing health. Uh, the second um, goal would be to defend populations against uh, threats to health. If you look at what is happening with Ebola in West Africa, if we had such powerful responsive systems, that are able to achieve what we are trying to, to build on, then we should have been able to cut down on some of the death that, has, that we've been able to witness in the last uh, several months. Uh, it should also be able to protect people against financial catastrophes. Uh, 
due to ill health. If someone is poor and they, they use all the savings they have in their family or within their communities to, to be able to access health services, um, that is no good. But if a system is able to render services uh, to a community without having to go into financial challenges to be able to, 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 to deal with challenges that come with bad health, um, then we are talking about uh, a powerful tool in our hands to address population health. It should also be able to uh, to provide equitable access to people centric uh, care. Uh, we are we are now we are we are seeing a move from uh, patient centric, where we are only dealing with individual patients, towards more of a community level uh, intervention uh, for health. Uh, a health system should be able to really increase access uh, in provision of uh, care at all people at different levels uh, within the uh, within the system. Uh, it should be, uh, uh, last but not least, it should be able to promote community engagement um, to be able to contribute to dialogue and communication uh, when making decisions about health and also formulating policy that will make it easier to provide services uh, to people who need them and when they need them. Uh, thank you very much. Those are a lot of great points uh, from Agnes, and it's actually a perfect segue for a question that I've got for uh, Dr. Quick. So actually, Agnes just mentioned Ebola, and we're thinking most of West Africa, Sierra Leone, the failure of the health systems there. So those are, that's an example of a not necessarily functioning health system. Um, you mentioned Afghanistan as being a health system that's actually grown and developed and uh, is sort of coming to light. What are other health systems that are being addressed effectively? Do you have additional examples of places where things are really working out for the best and coming together in an organized fashion? Uh, yes, I, and I would say first of all, no health system is perfect. Uh, we've got countries like France and Canada and you, in the United Kingdom that have a pretty good system. You could, uh, and I would argue that the U.S. has probably the best medical system in the world. If you're sick, you'll get treated well. It's <laughs> still working to be the best health uh, to be at the top flight of the health system. Definitely. Uh, in terms of health systems. Uh, countries uh, in Asia, Thailand has been one of the leaders and they've had a, a vision for a, a health system that really covers people. In Latin America, Mexico, Brazil have been countries that, that really have made great progress. Uh, in Africa, Ethiopia, South Africa, Ghana have been leaders. A great example of, of a country that's really made progress is Rwanda. Uh, the, the genocide was in the mid-90s. By the mid-2000s, it was still a chaotic health system. The, the World Bank said that it was, it was just catastrophic, but they came together. And with good leadership from the, the Ministry of Health up to President Kangemi, and with help from outside partners, they've developed the health workers, they've, they've organized the resources, uh, they've used techniques like uh, performance-based financing to actually integrate uh, a variety of services in with AIDS and maternal health and all and improve the quality and they've set up a universal health coverage program so there's some really good models uh, Ethiopia put 30,000 extension workers in the field within a couple of years because they realized their biggest problem at the time was pe people out there in the communities so countries have done have um, uh, targeted different parts of the health system and and there's some really good examples of progress with measurable health impact. Which is phenomenal because that's probably the most daunting thing is wondering how successful people will actually be in the implementation and the follow through. So thank you for that because yeah. <laughs> Uh, I was interested to hear you talking about universal health coverage. And so I've, let's just take the conversation there for a few minutes. Um, I'd like to throw this question to Terry. Terry, could you give us a, a in a nutshell definition or, or, or description of what we mean by the term universal health coverage? Of course, Greg. Great question. So let's bear in mind, the purpose of universal health coverage is to get a structure together which allows people to receive the services and not go bankrupt. And with the, if you're poor, you don't have the cost to pay for services, therefore you don't receive them. So we want the full spectrum of services available. Now we need to figure out how do we create the resources, the economic resources to bring these together. So think of not just health insurance. Think in the context of government funding. Think about how to get uh, cost sharing are going, risk protection. Various vehicles can come together to create this universal health coverage, which is critical for health systems to be successful. 
Okay, that's a great answer. And Terry, just a, a follow-up question to that. Could you perhaps give us uh, some specific goals of universal health coverage? Well, let me just give you the three that the World Bank has. One is that they want to see health service coverage. In other words, they want health service coverage to occur. Two, they want to see risk, financial risk protection to occur. In other words, having something in place so we don't go poor over this. And lastly, which we've brought, talked about in the very beginning, we want to talk about having equity or coverage for the entire population. This needs to cover all people. Got it. So I want to take this and talk to Dr. Quick about it. Um, how does he feel about UHC and how how do you think UHC can help strengthen a health system? What is its role in 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 health systems? So the, the, the first role is mobilizing all uh, potential resources for health. What we've seen is that um, a good universal health program brings together domestic resources, uh, tax resources, uh, other sorts of, of local resources, donor resources, private resources. So that's number one, mobilizing resources for health. Number two is using those resources in a way that improves the efficiency and the effectiveness of the health system. And, and number three, um, integrating that, um, integrating the health system. Universal health coverage, if we just look at women's health, university, universal health coverage is the only approach that tackles the needs of, of, of young, younger women, of women of reproductive ages, that tackles chronic diseases, that tack, tackles uh, communicable diseases, uh, diseases like AIDS. So it's, it's really that integration focus. Terry mentioned uh, equity. There's really good evidence if you look over the 10 or 20 years, and it takes time, in Brazil and Mexico, you can actually see the curves of inequity uh, where, where lower income people are getting closer and closer in terms of to the higher income people in terms of coverage, and the disparities in mortality, which are great, are going down. So it's great for equity. It's great for in introducing new approaches. Uh, Brazil, part of their universal health coverage was family care teams. Um, it's it's important to address neglected areas uh, like childhood cancers. Uh, Mexico had a huge impact on reducing mortality by including them. And efficiency. Uh, countries like Thailand have, have really looked uh, through their universal health program at how to get efficiencies in the provi provision of medicine. So it's mobilizing the resources, using them to uh, improve the efficiency and effectiveness, and really doing it in an integrated way rather than all of these different disease silos. And I'm really glad that you mentioned cancers because that's kind of my follow-up question. I wonder if you could expand on that. Um, and everyone, well, maybe not everyone, but it has been a growing Increase, I wouldn't say trend, but it's been increasingly getting to be much more of a threat globally with, in terms of non-communicable diseases, not just cancer, but anything non-communicable. Non and so I wonder, could you expand upon how health systems can help address NCDs? Uh, yes, and, and first, first to, to, um, to highlight, Jessica, your point about the, the, uh, uh, the magnitude of the problem, a lot of people don't realize that in low and middle income countries, for children, adolescents, and working age adults, preventable deaths from chronic diseases like heart disease, cancer, diabetes, lung disease, preventable deaths in those age groups are more than the totality of HTB and malaria deaths co uh, combined already. So it's a huge problem. If you look at, at, uh, at health systems today, um, as an example, Breast cancer and cervical cancer kill more women um, th than pregnancy and childbirth. But if you look at the health system, you, you could you could be you could think that that um, that women in, in those countries don't get cancer because there aren't services. So um, uh, that's that's a that's a key part of it is getting those services. The other thing is universal health coverage is sometimes misunderstood as about treatment. And that's where a lot of the money goes sometimes, but it's also about prevention. So with universal health programs, you really can, can get prevention into the mix. Uh, and and um, examples now are what Rwanda's doing, where they're 
are they have put in place screening for some of the early cancers and as part of their universal health coverage commitment they've made a commitment to universal access uh, to, to the uh, cervical cancer vaccine, to the HPV vaccine. And so it's, it, really, uh, it really brings up com chronic diseases, non-communicable disease. The other thing is, before the universal health movement came, you had AIDS, TB, malaria, family planning, child health, separate areas. Nobody was paying attention to chronic diseases. There was nobody who was looking at the totality of, of the morbidity and mortality and say, hey, we got to do something about that. So I think that's the real thing is that, that uh, universal health coverage ensures that or it sets up the conditions where a health system is looking at all of the conditions and putting its resources and attention where the uh, illness and, and death is happening. Got it. Uh, Jonathan, I wonder if I can I wonder if I can just take the conversation. That's a great answer, by the way. That was really interesting. I wonder if I can take us we've been talking about the what. And I wonder if we can shift the conversation slightly to the who. And I'd I just love your response. I'd love to hear your response to who are the stakeholders, who are the actors, who plays what role in, in our kind of collective uh, aspiration to improve health systems globally. Well, uh, speaking as a family physician, let me say that health is too important to be left just to the doctors. Uh, the doctors are part of it, um, but it, but it's really everybody. It's it's civil society, it's the private sector, it's leaders and managers in the health systems, it's students and researchers. There's really a role for everybody, and and this is particularly important in the context of universal health coverage where um, decisions are made about priorities and resources and every segment of society needs to be part of those decisions. We, we feel really strongly that when you have, for example, um, the National Hospital Insurance Fund in Kenya, $60 million, their, their board is 13 people and they've got people on that board as a result of, of, of some efforts um, that were involved in some time back that are from the employer section, from the faith-based community, teachers, other uh, civil society groups, as, as well as, as the government and the formal sector. So there's really a role for everybody in, in not just the provision, but also in the advocacy, in, in the prevention. It, it really it takes, it takes everybody to, um, to, to really to, to make the health system work, but to also hold it accountable for serving the, the needs of the population. Okay, I like, I like the phrase, it takes everybody, because it really does. I mean, I think, uh, and especially looping back to what you were saying earlier about, you know, when we were talking about, uh, you know, did, who gets involved, we were, you know, you mentioned the fact that health systems really requires engineers, IT people, uh, scientists, clinicians, it really needs a huge uh, sort of spectrum of human beings to get involved. And then that relates very nicely to what you've just said about the really responsibility to fix these things really falls, you know, to, mm -hmm. to, to everybody. It needs ah. a scientist. I second that. <laughs> well, that's actually, <laughs> um, we got a Twitter question that plays right into every comment. Um, and it's from our audience. It says, what type of experience and skills are necessary for a career in global health systems? We have a lot of students um, and people launching their career or even people trying to make a transition within their global health career. Um, who, when it comes to figuring out where you need to work on your skill building, you know, what would you say that the experience and the skills are needed out there? And I'm sorry, this one is for for Doctor Doctor Quick. Uh, you know, and I'll just paraphrase the question, uh, Jonathan. I, I imagine what they're asking is, who would you hire? <laughs> <laughs> That's you're, a more direct way to put it. Yeah, you're the chief exec. <laughs> so, yeah, and and um. Uh, and I get that question a lot. And we have come. And I'll tell you who we have hired. We've had, we've had, uh, we have some. We probably have a couple of butchers and bakers somewhere. But we 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 have lawyers. We have communications experts. We have IT people. We have graphic designers. Uh, we have uh, we have researchers. Uh, we have people whose expertise is, is in adult education. Um, we we have people who have MBAs. Um, and what I would say is that look at people who are interested in glo global health. That's, that's a passion. What's their talent? And, and look where the intersection of their passion and their talent is. And uh, there are such a wide range of disciplines. What I would not do is go into 
get an MPH because people say you got to have an MPH or go to medical school because people say well you got to be a doctor uh, yes there are lots of people with each of those degrees but there are lots of people having a huge impact um, with uh, with other sorts of, of, of degrees and, and, and background and experience and the other thing is don't let people tell you to leave particular background off your CV because it's not relevant. I saw somebody, the most interesting thing, the most appealing thing about them was work that they had done in customer relations and client stuff and all of that, which their, their mentor said to take off the CV because it wasn't relevant. It's always relevant. <laughs> That's yes. incredibly sound advice, and I think there's a huge population of people who are involved with Twig who need that kind of guidance. So thank you so much. I think it's great to hear sound advice from somebody who's at the top level and and is honestly constantly looking for for new caliber or high caliber yeah. people as well. Yeah, and you know what? it's nice too because I feel like in a lot of our episodes, especially the careers, we keep pushing this theme: global health needs everybody. So mm -hmm. everyone get involved and everyone be part of our community because we need you all. Yeah, it's completely transdisciplinary, so huge emphasis on, on crossover mm -hmm. there. Um, I also have a question for Terry, actually, um, and this has to do with a recent publication. Did we see something published this past week on global health systems that you would like to tell us about? Hey, uh, Chris, great question because it just matches what's going on with global health. The Respect British Journal, called The Lancet, has teamed up with the Commonwealth Fund here in the United States. They're going to be publishing a whole series on global health systems, our monthly topic. In doing that, they're looking at the various factors of success of global health systems around the world. Sweden's the first country. At the end of the session, you'll be able to get into the twig notes. You'll see the link we put in there. You can review these publications for free. And let me also mention, Management Sciences for Health, Dr. Quick's operation, has wonderful resources listed right on their pages also. Videos, publications, Downloadable PDFs, a great resource for everybody to look in and also for recruiting, by the way. Okay, thanks very much, Terry. <laughs> Listen, it's been a fantastic show. We're probably going to end it about there right now. Does anybody have any final words, any last thoughts they just want to throw in there before we end things? Or are there any other questions that have come over Twitter that we wanted to address quickly? Um, let me see. We've, let's see. There's a couple that are more specific to... Um, certain healthcare systems. I just, it was such a pleasure to have everybody on this panel today. I'm, I'm in awe of everyone's work. So thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah. And let me just say that we're going to be talking about health systems during the month of January. Uh, next week, actually, we're going to be doing something slightly different. And I'll tell you about that quickly now. Uh, next week, we're going to be bringing someone on the show who's got a fantastic innovation. And we're going to be using this platform to try and give that innovation a bit of visibility. Um, we're really excited about it. So we're going to call next week kind of an, an innovation hub uh, episode. But other, other than that, we're going to be talking about health systems during the month of January. Thanks, everyone, for watching. It's been fantastic having you with us. Um, if you're watching this on, 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 on YouTube in the future, we, we, we love you guys. Remember to share this with your friends, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as always, don't do drugs. Always do your best. Don't ever change. And we will see you next week, same time, same place. Okay.